Hey folks, last episode we learned how European settlers, through deforestation, the damming of rivers, overfishing, and pollution, caused Atlantic salmon to become extirpated from Lake Ontario by 1898. Now most of the people that were involved in those actions didn't know that this is what was happening. They were just trying to survive in an unfamiliar land. I personally don't hold anything against them for those actions. They didn't have the ecological understanding that we do now. Ecological refers to the study of the relationship of living organisms to one another and to their physical surroundings. Most of the people that were involved in those actions didn't realize that they were causing Atlantic salmon to disappear from Lake Ontario. These were mistakes, errors. I personally don't think that mistakes are necessarily all bad, if we can learn from them and learn to do things better. When we realize that mistakes have been made or are being made, we can correct our course and even reverse some of the damage that's been done. Ecological restoration is a process that reverses damage done to the natural world. The Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program's goal is to restore a self-sustaining population of Atlantic salmon back into Lake Ontario. This means that the Atlantic salmon are able to keep going and growing through their own natural reproduction. This week we've got Catherine back to teach us about what is involved in this restoration effort. But first we're going to check on our hatcheries, then we'll hear from Catherine, then we'll get another fishy fact from Johnny. Let's check on our hatcheries. All right, starting with hatchery number one. Filter? Not working! The power went off earlier today for a few minutes. So far this year, both of our filters have restarted on their own after a power outage. But not this filter, this time. Our tank water has been slowly evaporating, and the level is getting low. This may be a reason for the filter not firing back up properly on its own this time. We will get this filter going again by priming the filter pump, and then I will come back later to top up the tank with clean, unchlorinated water. To prime the filter pump, I add water from the tank to the top of it to push the air out so that it is able to pump the water. And there it goes. Let's not forget about the rest of the equipment. Air pump? Check. Temperature? just under 4 degrees Celsius. Our Atlantic salmon are still eyed eggs. I see a tail. Our Atlantic salmon eyed eggs in hatchery number one are starting to hatch into Elvin. Checking on hatchery number two. Filter? Check. Air pump? Check. Temperature? Just under 7 degrees Celsius. Most of the elven are hiding under the rocks. We have had one casualty. Again, this happens and it is perfectly natural. Time for our presentations. The program is built around four pillars that all have the same goal, to once again have a self-sustaining and naturally reproducing population of Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario. The fish that we release come from hatcheries. 
And you may wonder where these fish come from, considering that we lost our Lake Ontario strain over 120 years ago. Though we would have preferred to use our local strain, obviously that's not possible. So we're using two strains from out east, the La Havre strain from Nova Scotia and the Sebago strain from Maine, with the hope that they will create a new Lake Ontario strain adapted to the lake's current ecosystem. Howard Fish Culture Station keeps their broodstock or adult Atlantics and spawns them each fall. I know this looks kind of rough, but the fish are sedated so they're relaxed. Hatchery staff have cared for these fish all their lives, and so the fish's health is their priority. When the female is ready to lay eggs, the staff stroke her belly and then collect the eggs in a bowl. The milt from a male then fertilizes the eggs. The eggs develop in trays, and when they're at the eyed egg stage, they're delivered to our classroom hatchery tanks. The rest of the eggs are transferred to Normandale Fish Culture Station, where they are raised until they are old enough to be stocked into streams. We stock three life stages, spring fry, fall fingerlings, and spring yearlings. Spring fry are stocked in May. They've been raised at warmer temperatures and they've been fed, so they're much larger than the classroom hatchery fish, which are released at the same time. The hatchery truck arrives at a stocking location and the fish are netted into bags, which are filled with oxygen. The oxygen diffuses into the water, which allows the fish to breathe, even though there is little water in the bag itself. Volunteers then carry the bags, sometimes float them downstream, and release the fish. The fish quickly orient in the water, facing upstream. In the fall, we stock fall fingerlings, or par. These fish are much larger, so we can use hose stocking, where we connect the hose to the truck and then pump out the water and the fish. These larger fish then disperse throughout the stream. In early spring, or a third life stage, spring yearlings are stocked. These fish are over a year old, and most will smolt soon after stocking, swimming downstream and entering the lake. Of course, we don't want to put fish in streams that can't support them. So our second pillar is habitat and water quality enhancement. This means that we do projects ranging from tree planting and garbage cleanups to enhancing cattle crossings and dam and pond mitigation. Picking up garbage is an easy activity that everyone can do. By removing trash from the ground, you're preventing it from being washed or blown into the stream. Trash in the water might be eaten by aquatic organisms, pollute the water, or be carried down to the lake. Humans also enjoy areas more when they look clean. Plus, you'll never know what you find. Tree planting has a ton of benefits. It's the best way to stabilize banks because tree roots bind soil together. Tree roots also filter pollutants that run off roads, agricultural fields, and lawns, helping to clean the water. They also hold onto water that is absorbed in the soil reducing the effect of heavy rainfalls and releasing water during droughts. Trees also provide shade. Have you ever stood outside on a hot day? You're hotter in the sun than in the shade, right? Same thing happens with water. Fish cannot regulate their body temperatures. They are ectotherms, meaning their body temperature is dependent on the external environment. That means if you heat up the water, you heat up the fish. Some fish, like Atlantic salmon, require cold water to survive and cutting down trees has led to an increase in stream temperature that harms these fish. Even when trees fall down, they create important habitat for both the fish and the invertebrates they feed on. The great thing about planting trees is that they help fish no matter where you plant them. A tree in your backyard or by a parking lot will help keep the ground cool, which means that rainwater will be cooler when it travels over the ground and enters the stream. Here's an example of an old bridge crossing on a golf course that was disintegrating. The culverts were clogged and too high, which was not good for fish movement. Staff were able to remove the bridge so that the stream is now accessible to all fish and invertebrates. And even the old concrete was put to good use. We created fox dens and garter snake hibernaculums to provide habitat for these animals that would in turn control rodents. We have also helped to remove several man-made ponds. Ponds like this create a large area of slow moving water that is not shaded, which warms up the water flowing downstream. It also holds back sediments, including nutrients that are necessary for primary producers downstream. 
Staff drained the pond and created a new stream channel. Then they planted trees to stabilize the newly created bank. We want to make sure that what we're doing is working, and so research and monitoring is an important pillar. Aquatic animals require specialized equipment to sample safely. Electrofishing is a standard method for assessing fish communities. Basically, we're using electricity and water in a very controlled way with lots of safety features. Do not try this at home. But trained staff can use this method, which temporarily stuns the fish. We then catch each fish, which means we can identify, count, and weigh how many fish are in a section or stream. This tells us not only how many Atlantic salmon are there, but also about the entire fish community, giving us an index of stream health. Other methods of monitoring that we've used include smolt traps, which capture a proportion of the fish migrating downstream, and funnel traps, which capture all the fish in smaller streams. Researchers empty the trap, collect the fish, and identify them before releasing them downstream. Sometimes you want to know more about individual movement, so you may mark the fish to tell them apart. This individual has some dye injected. Let's call her Daisy. If they catch Daisy again, they'll know how far she traveled and how much she grew, which will give us more detailed information about what she did. Another habitat project involves dams. Dams block fish movement. For some dams, there are fish ladders installed. A fishway is basically a ladder, where instead of one big jump, fish have to make several small jumps to get past the dam. In two fishways on streams in southern Ontario, we have cameras installed. These cameras take a video of every single fish that migrates upstream. That allows us to identify and count every single salmonid, including Atlantic salmon, that migrate upstream. Sometimes there are over 20,000 fish that have to be counted and identified in these videos. That's a lot of work. And sometimes we see other critters also swimming past the camera. We want to create new environmental stewards, and so our fourth pillar, education and outreach, includes the classroom hatchery program. Our goal is to educate young people about the mistakes of the past and inspire them to have good values to prevent those choices from happening again in the future. We also do outreach at a variety of public events, including conferences, naturalist clubs, fly fishing clubs, and universities. The public can also support the program by adopting an Atlantic where you can name one of the broodstock and contribute to ongoing research. So that's a brief overview of how our program is structured and the types of activities that we do. We couldn't do these projects without the help of partner organizations and volunteers. Stocking spring fry and tree planting both involve numerous volunteers to help us get those fish and trees where they need to be. So as you walk around the landscape, perhaps think about those small things you can do to help these fish. Pick up the trash, make sure it ends up in a garbage, and perhaps get involved in tree planting or garbage cleanup activities in your neighborhood. Lots of little things can make a big difference. Welcome to another segment of Fishy Facts. As always, I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're going to talk about a really cool fish, the flying fish. Flying fish are found in temperate and tropical marine climates across the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. They typically grow between 17 and 30 centimeters, but can also reach up to 45 centimeters in length. Flying fish feed on plankton, although they sometimes consume small crustaceans. Flying fish do not fly, but rather glide. Their streamlined bodies help them break the water's surface at speeds up to 56 kilometers per hour, and their large wing-like pectoral fins help them glide distances up to 200 meters. That's slightly longer than two football fields. Some species of flying fish also have large wing-like pelvic fins and are known as four-winged flying fish. Flying fish have uneven tails with a lower lobe that is longer than the upper lobe and they flap their tail along the water's surface to maintain or extend their glide. By using this method, flying fish have been recorded using consecutive glides spanning distances up to 400 meters. 
flying fish will glide to avoid aquatic predators, such as tuna, marlin, dorado, or other large fish species. But they must be careful. Too much lift, and they become easy pickings for hungry seabirds. Flying fish are attracted to light, and they are known to leap into well-lit boats. Commercial fishermen use this to their advantage when pursuing flying fish. Along with their flesh, flying fish roe, or eggs, are a popular food item in many countries. Flying fish roe is especially popular in various sushi dishes and is called tobiko, which is Japanese for flying fish roe. Well, thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the flying fish and be sure to check out next week's segment. Thanks everyone. We are part of nature. So when we destroy it, we destroy ourselves. And when we restore it, we restore ourselves. Thanks again, Catherine and Johnny, for helping us learn today. In our next episode, we're going to be learning about some other challenges for Atlantic salmon. Until then, keep on swimming upstream.